Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this. This is now the eighth lecture and we're going to cover uh, one chapter and a bit of another chapter. And the two main ones are, as you can see there, chapter 14 and chapter 15. I'm going to do a little bit of introduction and I will do sort of two chunks of commentary on each chapter. It's quite a full lecture. Um, so I think we'll push towards uh, 50 minutes to 60 minutes. I do request everybody to go on mute. I can hear some noise in the background. If you don't mind, mute yourself. It would be helpful. Okay. Um, so this is uh, the graphic I use to explain the central section of volume one. And what you can see is that we are now looking at chapters 14 and 15, which deal with relative surplus value. We're very much in the center of things now. The main thesis of the book uh, is about the production of surplus value in capitalist production. And what uh, I'm going to point out as we go through is that Marx, despite the organization of the book by sort of part headings, he does integrate quite uh, consistently his concept of relative surplus value with a lot of the material he looked at uh, when he was uh, writing about absolute surplus value back in chapter 10. And he further does anticipate a discussion which he has later on about the intensity of labor. And finally, something which he doesn't actually develop, which I will point out, is this question of the connection of relative surplus value with a uh, surplus value which comes from super exploitation of more oppressed uh, sections of the working class. So we'll come to that. Uh, in terms of summary, we looked at chapters 12 and 13 last time. Mm -hmm. Chapter 12 is on the concept of relative surplus value. And the basic idea is uh, the general uh, increase of relative surplus value will come about if necessary labor time is shorter, which means obviously that for a given length of a working day, surplus labor time will be longer. So Marx then says, well, if that's the general condition under which capital as a whole can increase surplus value by the relative shortening of necessary labor time, how can this come about? And he says, well, it basically comes about in two ways. <clears throat> One is uh, we labor powers value can be reduced by cutting wages, but we won't be looking at that because that will violate the idea that the commodities are actually exchange at their values. So he's aware of it, but he doesn't investigate it too much. And so what he concentrates on is that the value of labor power is reduced because the commodities that laborers consume themselves are made cheaper by higher labor productivity. And this is really what he's interested in, which is how capitalism has uh, got its own incentive <clears throat> or imminent drive, as he, he puts it, to increase labor productivity. It's also very important the way he argues this, uh, how it actually comes about, um, is, is it doesn't start from the general. It starts from the incentive on each individual capital to increase the productivity of the laborers which it's exploiting because if it is able to do that it will reduce the labor time that uh, goes into the commodities being produced so if you like the individual value will be less and that its commodities will be cheaper than those of its competitors so this is the sort of the the sequence which Mark, with, with which marx explains the production of relative surplus value he starts from this individual innovating capital and then he sees how this will affect the other capitals who are producing the same commodity in the same branch or what we would say today probably industrial sector and so they either have to uh, um, adapt or die basically they either have to take on the new technology or the new organization of production and they too <clears throat> make their commodities cheaper or they'll just be pushed out in the market so that's the, the sort of basic driver or mechanism of the basic driver. And then it depends. If the commodities being produced are things like shirts and honey and other stuff which workers consume, then they will cheapen the commodities of workers across the board and therefore 
serve this purpose of reducing necessary labor time. Okay, so it's only if the commodities produced are consumed by workers will we have this general effect. Marx uh, talked about uh, the value of commodities, therefore being in the inverse ratio to the productivity of labor. So too does the value of labor power, since it depends on the values of commodities. So as um, labor becomes more productive, uh, so the value of labor power will fall in relative terms. The other uh, summary I want to give is of chapter 13, which uh, I think uh, you've probably just been reading. And he starts off with this idea basically of centralization, which is that bringing the workers together in one place, previously scattered uh, workers brought together in one place. And he contrasts this uh, cooperation. <clears throat> cooperation is slightly inverted commas, because of course, uh, people working together alongside each other is cooperation. Uh, but uh, we have a sense, or maybe there's a slight association with the word with it being voluntary. Of course, very often it's not voluntary cooperation, but it's done by order, basically. And Marx does look at the difference or the issue of how capitalist cooperation compares with earlier modes. And he also looks at how cooperation develops within the capitalist mode of production. Um, so he sees cooperation as a major connection with increasing the productivity of labor. He sees that from the 15th to the 17th centuries in England, uh, capitalists who put workers into at the same place at the same time would uh, effectively, that was the initial capitalist cooperation, and they would get the benefit of it. And what I'm saying is, of course, this is also a similar time period within, in which Marx had already been talking about the struggle of capitalists to increase the length of the working day. Okay, from uh, you know what it was in feudal times to much longer working days, in fact. So um, the simple cooperation form uh, where workers don't actually change very much what they've been doing, but they work side by side under one roof. Um, doesn't stay like that. It moves uh, forwards in a sense, or I mean, certain respects backwards, perhaps, but it moves uh, into more developed forms. And it's the development is that capital doesn't sit idle, but takes direct hold of the labor process. And it does it in two ways, and this is often forgotten. The first way that Marx looks at is reorganization of production. And that is about manufacture. It's not yet specifically about machinery. It's about redividing how the work process actually takes place, setting up in a different way. And then he talks about how on that basis, uh, there was this huge development of machine production at the end of the 18th century, which we know as the Industrial Revolution. Um, He's very sensitive to the, the effect of productivity increases, uh, which are, if you like, uh, good for capital, but they're very bad for the workers. They reduce the workers' independence. And he, uh, later on in volume one, he develops the idea of subsumption to discuss that a bit more. So then we look at um, the, the substance of what we're looking at today. The first chapter is chapter 14, the division of labor and manufacture. And as I've already sort of stated, he's looking at the, he's really looking at the first main phase of capitalist production. So we are into a form of capitalism here, but it's the early capitalist production. And the focus is on the workshop rather than the factory. Okay. And so what he does here is he brings together the conceptual derivation of chapter 12 and chapter 13 about cooperation. And the whole thing really about manufacture is it's reorganizing the labor process in a way which suits capital. It's a capitalist division of labor. And this is the stage of capitalism. I mean, Mark, Marx is uh, discussing similar territory to that which Adam Smith celebrated. And, I mean, Wealth of Nations came out in 1776 and it was really at the end of this manufacturing period and the vision of labor is celebrated by adam smith and marx is sort of reworking the mismaterial in a much more critical way 
Um, so this is this one is already saying what I've said. Um, manufacture comes about in two ways. Uh, one way is that the various independent handicrafts uh, uh, work in a way where there's like a process. Uh, he'll develop this idea a bit more. We'll expand on this a little bit more. Where actually it's got a lot, a lot of different jobs have to be done to produce one thing. And the clear example he gives there is making a coach. You know, you've got to have people making the wheels. I don't know, making all the bits and pieces, seats, etc., which go into a coach. Uh, and then, so in the traditional trades, there would be a lot of different uh, tradesmen, in, uh, mostly men, I guess, involved in that. Um, but then there's also a situation where the, the workers can be brought together, but they're all basically doing the same job. Uh, they're just doing it alongside each other. And he calls this cooperation in its simplest form. Uh, Marx uh, says that the beginnings of the capitalist division of labour are quite accidental. But once they start, then they take on a certain mm, momentum. They develop a certain momentum of their own. But the, the point he's developing here is this sort of idea of a collective social uh, labour emerging. So the commodity from being the product of one individual independent craftsmen becomes the social product of a union of craftsmen, each of whom performs one and only one of the constituent partial operations. This picture is uh, from the Adam Smith's uh, celebration of Adam Smith. This is the famous pin factory. This is, uh, no, actually, sorry, I beg your pardon. This is, um, I think, something else, but it is from that institute. Okay, uh, it's a fairly benign picture is what I'm trying to get at of this uh, the division of labor as it developed. <clears throat> so the final form of manufacture is always the same, a uh, productive mechanism where the actual mechanism is made up of human beings. But in order to do that, the actual role of each individual changes. And what were handicraft trades become decomposed and they become restructured as the job become uh, narrowed into very specific tasks. So rather than having a range of tasks, what the division labor, and this is uh, what Smith celebrated, becomes much narrow and much more repetitive. They become like partial functions. So the skill of the craftsman is the foundation of this, but uh, capital is beginning to make uh, this more and more partial. So it's a particular type of cooperation. Now, this is a very important point. Um, the advantages of cooperation are still there, and Marx will, will go on to see what some of them are, right? But it's the capitalist who is the sort of the bringing together of cooperative work, and therefore it's generally speaking the capitalist who gets the benefit of it. So Marx looks at this from the point of view of the workers working life um, and they be, operations tend to be limited to a few tools. I was trying to work out what these tools are here. I'm not sure if that's a screwdriver or a soldering iron. I mean, a lot of simple but highly repetitive jobs. And so the work has become very specialized but in a very one-sided way. And they'll be using very specialized tools in order to carry out that job. And Marx gives the example of specialization of tools used by the workers in Birmingham alone, there were 500 varieties of hammer. Now these are still hand tools, uh, in case you don't know what a hammer looks like, and I'm sure you do. Uh, here's some example of some hammers, right? Um, but clearly just by their shape and so on, their specialization of hand tools. So this is still um, within the scope of the skill of, of the worker in, some, in, in certain respect. Um, now, what Marx doesn't say, well, I'm sure he wouldn't have a problem with this in principle, but it is important when we're talking about Birmingham in this period to talk about its connection with what the products were used for. And to a large degree, they were used for the enslavement of Africans and other such oppressive things. Now, Marx talks about um, two fundamental forms of manufacture. This is an idea that he's already seeded and he, he develops it a bit more. The example he gives of what he calls heterogeneous manufacture 
is uh, Swiss watchmaking in actual fact, right? And what he sees it as, as there's a lot of specialized jobs. Uh, some bits are made by some guys in one place, other bits are made by other guys in another place. And they're only kind of like brought together and assembled towards the end. Okay, so the bits have an external relation with each other. So there's sort of strong materiality to this. It's in what the material technical process is. And in this context is interesting because he didn't really talk much in actual fact, volume one doesn't talk much about outworkers in terms of the putting out system. But he does bring in outworking much more in this context where he talks about a system of manufacture which depends heavily on auxiliary workers doing their little bits and pieces. Uh, and I don't know what all the different bits are called. So. Uh, but he actually lists uh, it's about half a page you'll you'll read it of the different trades you uh whose whose skills are used to make very particular parts of a watch before they're brought together so in that sense a watch is very similar to a coach uh you know an assemblage of many different parts so in this case um it's a lot of splitting up a lot of scattering of the workers and this actually reads very modern. Um, what you'll find is that capitalists can, you know, it's like hot desking today or something like that, right? So a capitalist actually gets a lot of advantages as from workers working at home. I mean, it is something which if he doesn't do, this is again the, the sort of the impress of competition. If it's a cheaper way of doing it and one capitalist doesn't do it, then they're going to be producing their watches more expensively than their competitors. So, you know, the out, outsourcing, to home working. I say outsourcing, they're still under the control of the capitalist. It's, it's, they're not independent <coughs> producers. They're just part of a scattered collective, if that makes sense. Okay, so the, if they were independent, they would have their own customers. They're not independent. They, their jobs are given to them uh, from the capitalists and they're answerable to the capitalists for their work. Uh, this is a, an illustration from a I think this comes from a later period. This is actually a Swiss luxury watchmaker's illustration. I was looking for an illustration of the early period, I didn't find one. The reason why this is a later period, and we'll come to it, is because this is a big clue. This is a pulley system. So this is actually coming into machine manufacture. Um, the other type of manufacture, um, okay, no, this is still, sorry, this is still, yeah, this is the other type. We just got to check my. This is known as organic manufacture, and this is where you know we have needles. Is used as one. I think actually it's easier to grasp the idea of glass bottles. You know, you can't make half a glass bottle basically. It's all got to be done quite rapidly, step by step, but in one continuous process. So what you get is a lot of workers taking on different phases of uh, producing one physical product uh, as as closely connected aspects of the of the work process and so what you get is as well as this sort of subdivision step by step uh if you followed one item through you also get is a rapid uh reproduction of these roles sort of all working simultaneously in, in, with inside the workshop so <coughs> here the socially necessary labor time is beginning to be uh, much less about what is is realized that in the sale of a commodity it begins to imprint itself in the organization of the labor process itself okay and so it becomes to appear as like a technical process what do i mean by this right so if you're making bottles you need 50 uh, caps and 50 bottles and they all need to arrive at the same time uh, i mean that's that's a technical relation but actually it's it's a sort of a part of the necessity of coordinating everything within one process okay you might have to think of better examples um i mean one modern example would be making circuit boards i mean you've got to have all the resistors and all the transistors and all the capacitors or whatever arriving at the same point uh you know to go together this is um Again, from this sort of rather benign view, this is a sort of the Adam Smith view. It's hard to get a less benign pictorial to have to say, right? Um, but these are different rooms <coughs> in the factory, in the workshop, I should say. So this is all hand powered still, pretty much. 
that they'll do in different jobs on the way to making the pin. But they'll keep doing the same job time and time and time again, each, each in their role. Right, so the effect on the workers is that in effect, the collectivity of the workers, which is this combination of individual specialized workers, <coughs> is itself becoming the machinery. That's how Marx puts it. So the, it, the collective worker is the item of machinery, which is specifically characteristic of the manufacturing period. Uh, so what with this uh, one sidedness and partiality of functions, manufacturer is beginning to reorganize what the different labor powers are, what they're doing, what degrees of training that they have. You know, the medieval apprenticeships, for example, will be will be got rid of. So rather than the different crafts, what you begin to get, and he uses this term so-called uh, skilled workers and unskilled workers in a, in a, in a different organisation and a different hierarchy, if you like, in terms of the workforce. So some jobs will disappear, excuse me. And especially, uh, you know, the five year or seven year apprenticeship is pushed into the background and other <laughs> as, as new roles are defined, so the training period for them becomes different. The formation of the labour power to perform these roles becomes different. And so this is quite a critical view. It's quite different uh, to Smith, and it's a class standpoint. He's concerned about the effects not only on the individual worker and their alienation, but on the collectivity of the workers. So you're talking about different grades of workers, different roles and so on. Uh, the workers... Uh, internal hierarchies are being reproduced uh, because of the, their relation with the labor process, the production process. Uh, now, this is a direct critique now of Smith. Uh, Smith, um, okay, sorry, I jumped one ahead. I'll do this one first, right? He also talked about division of labor. I've got to uh, give myself a better view of this. That's what's happening. I'll just move these around a bit. If I get rid of that, I can't. Okay. Uh, division of labor in society as related to uh, division of labor in manufacture. Okay. And so when we talk about division of labor in society, we're really talking about whole industries, you know, sort of like large quantities of workforce and resources going into one area of production or another. And that's uh, related to, but distinct from a division of labor within a workshop, you know, the detail of who does what job type thing, right? And Marx discusses this. He's, he's interested in how this comes about. And he thinks that there are two distinct starting points, which kind of like begin to you know, what's the word, combine in some ways. Right? The first one is the slightly more traditional, if you like, or uh, you know, going further back in time, the basis is physiological. You know, certain people have certain roles based on age and gender and so on. And there is a community. But, but then he does distinguish this. He doesn't develop this very much. He, I mean, the development of this is more done by Engels in his sort of related work, uh, which comes later. But Marx distinguishes the sort of a purely physiological basis uh, of a division of labor with one a division of labor which is brought about because of commodity exchange. And he, he sees the division of labor in manufacture as being everything has a physiological basis of course right but he sees it's this second social construction of division of labor as being more important and if you like over determining or you know being being the, the more significant of the two um he draws a, quite a lot of attention to a difference between town and country i mean this illustration is not terribly clear but this is like a mill so in the late Middle Ages, feudal times and so on, you know, people would bring their wheat or whatever to be milled. And so what you have is a, a division of labor within the sort of feudal society, which is beginning to, towns begin to come, come about, basically. We simply saw Salisbury and Salisbury was a, a, a city because we've got a cathedral, but it's basically a wool town. And, you know, all the wool was brought in from onto the market and there was some wool production in the town stroke city of Salisbury. So what you have is a division of labor um, 
which does acquire a certain degree of development in, in terms of sort of difference between industry and agriculture is the basic idea here and it's territorial um, now Marx also mentions and it's not much more of a mention I have to you know have to say <clears throat> that there's also a division of labor between um, manufacturing and a colonial system and the world market which in particular he he positions as being furnishing uh, but he he tends to see this and um, um, note this as a point of contrast he doesn't yet develop a systematic view of this relationship he just sees these as sort of like con points of contrast and he does tend to use india a bit more in this uh, chapter uh, other chapters he uses the example of slavery quite often as a point of contrast right so he talked for example he talks about the population density which is about you know the formation of towns and so on uh, and compares us and india right and he basically is saying um yeah well he's writing at a time when this was all happening you know we had the civil war in the united states the british were looking to spread the basis of uh, cotton production to keep their factories going they had another good look at india and had a good look at egypt and so on so these were sort of really quite uh, contemporary points uh, but he's what he's pointing out here and this is developed much more in, in other work right he but he's, what he's pointing out is that the demand for cotton in india was a cause of famines uh, because it broke down the traditional division of labor in society which was a way of avoiding famine uh, okay so against adam smith basically Adam Smith is basically saying there's not much difference in principle between the division of labor in society as a whole and division of labor in manufacture. The only real difference is it's easier to see one than it is to see the other. You can look at a workshop and see what's going on. So you have to take a bigger step back, if you like, to see what's going on in a whole society. Now, Marx takes a different view, and it's very much uh, uh, it's a conscious critique of that position. Right. He's basically saying no, because in uh, within a workshop, there is not commodity exchange. But once commodity exchange develops and it's commodity exchange, which drives the division of labor. Right. And so there's a difference in kind, not just in scale between these two things. Right. Um, yeah. So there's no necessary sort of example, for example, getting a harmony. Uh, through market mechanisms of provide pr providing different types of commodities uh, through a social division of labor is a much more complicated process than in a workshop, you know, just putting certain resource into that room and another resource into another room and so on, right, to get it right. This is a tannery in Bolton. Um, so what he's, he's critiquing this view of division of labor, basically, and he uses tanneries as an example in actual fact which is why i put it up there um he basically says it's a bourgeois consciousness which celebrates the division of labor in the workshop i mean of course they're in control of this division of labor the lifelong annexation of the worker to a partial operation his complete subjection to capital as an organization of labor that increases its productive power and yet, at the same time, capital denounces with equal vigor every conscious attempt to control and regulate the process of production socially, i.e. A, a type of a planned economy, as an inroad upon such sacred things as the rights of property, freedom, and the self-determining genius of the individual capitalist. So this is marked at his critical best, really, I would say. Um, manufacture is capitalist manufacture okay so the, there's issues about how much capital is needed uh, to start off um this whole question which we've already uh, rehearsed quite a lot of the breaking down of handicraft roles into sort of more one-sided activities um this comes up against uh obstacles uh, one of the obstacles is uh that actually at a certain point you're going to need uh, machinery that's the next sort of step that he's he's getting on to right uh but if you're going to have machinery then what about these sort of uh, human-based uh activities 
let me just try to summarize what he, he says. He says the essence of manufacture is, uh, as well as in simple com com cooperation, collective working organism is a form of existence of capital. As a specifically capitalist form of the process of social production, the division of labor in manufacture is merely a particular method of creating relative surplus value. I'm emphasizing that, right? That's why they do it, to increase relative surplus value or of augmenting the self valorization of capital, usually described as social wealth, etc., which is all like inverted commas, right? At the expense of the worker. Not only does it increase the socially productive power of labor for the benefit of the capitalist instead of the worker, it also does this by crippling the individual worker. It produces new conditions for the domination of capital over labor. It therefore, on the one hand, appears historically as an advance and a necessary aspect of the economic process of the formation of society. And on the other hand, it appears as a more refined and civilized means of exploitation. So my commentary on this is, I, I think Marx has got a very disciplined uh, focus on this. He deals with it very well, I think. He controls his angle of analysis or plane of ab abstraction through different perspectives and different levels, and particularly the contrast between the workshop and society as a whole. Um, he does consider it from the different angles that include the two sides of the capital labor relation. I mean, why does capital do, do, do it? What's, what happens to labor in this relation? He doesn't really write a history of the class struggle of this period, but it is quite important this, I think, right? He has got an epistemological standpoint. He's concerned about how did this affect the workers, right? He's not, he's not um, what's the word, a, a technological optimist for its own sake at all. Right. He sees that there was an increase in productivity through cooperation and, and manufacture, uh, but he also sees at the same time the social perspective of this. Um, I think there are some glimpses of the international aspect, but they are quite limited, I have to say. And uh, as I kind of already mentioned, I think he uses them more as a point of contrast than anything else. The other thing about this uh, chapter 14, I would say, is that it is very well connected with the rest of the book. It can, it, I, you know, I'm just kind of summarizing points I've already made. Right? It moves very smoothly on from chapters 12 and 13, and it gives us a very good preparation for chapter 15. He's looking now at the organization, the labor process. OK, and what he's basically said is he's reduced the worker to becoming a machine, the machine like operation of the human being. He contrasts this with the simple commodity production um, and there's even more discipline now within the production process. Okay. Right. And these are my comments on it, um, which I'm going to, I've just noticed the time actually. Uh, that would be, if you're watching this as a recording, maybe a place to take a break, but I'm speaking live now. So I, I do need to press on <coughs> to chapter 15, right? I'm going to look at the first three sections of chapter 15 and, and it's now the machine which is the means of producing more surplus value. So what you've got now is the instruments of labor are no longer the hammer, but they'll become the steam hammer. Okay, so this is not just a reorganization of the methods of production. This is a reorganization of the means of production. There is a very interesting uh, short footnote, but I think it distills Marx's approach to method, which for sort of slightly broader reasons I draw your attention to. Uh, and what he basically says is it's an abstract materialism just to move from the phenomenal forms to the essence of things. What you also need to do methodologically is move from this essence back to the actual forms of appearance. Uh, and, you know, I make this point quite a lot. I, the reason I make it is because some um, use it to support the argument that you don't get the full story until you look at volume three, because there he's looking at how the essence actually appears in the capital system. 
but I think this is he doesn't make it that point here, but I'm um, I'm extrapolating. He does make a good summary of his methodology here. Uh, the development of machinery starts with tools. Um, it moves on to the motive power. So what we're talking about here is water mills, and uh, Arkwright's uh, factories uh, is celebrated. I have to say, in England, as being the first such. Uh, the spinning mill uh, in the Midlands, basically. And the other one which is celebrated here is the double acting steam engine by Watt. And what Watt does is, this is a movement from water mill to steam power, okay? So this is about the motive power that's driving the machinery. And between the tools and the motive power, which is no longer human, but if you like itself a machine, yet need a transmitting mechanism. So these are the three physical uh, components of the development of machinery. This is uh, Arkwright's mule. You can see the transmitting mechanism, the big uh, belt and stuff, and then all these throttles, as they were called, and spindles. A real machine system takes the place of independent machines. The object of labor goes through a connected process of graduated processes, a connected series, sorry, of graduated processes carried out by a chain of mutually complementary machines of various kinds. So he's talking about a machine system. So what was the cooperation by division of labor of human beings becomes a division of labor of the machines that are combined into in their specific functions. It's, it's very um, perceptive, I, I think, and illuminating what Marx is telling us here. He does then talk about the machine system being a mechanical monster. He sees, uh, he uses the term autom automaton more than once, I mean, several times actually. Uh, and that reduces the worker to being like the one who tends the machine, okay? So there's a lot of uh, social consequences and how the technical and the social interact with the workers is a very big concern he has, right? I mean, if one of the things is the workers that make the machines, I mean, they start off as being quite skilled workers, but they themselves get displaced by machinery. And so it becomes that uh, machines make machines um, in his argument. And I don't know if you can quite pick it up from these two illustrations, but this is a, a a man looking after the machinery and this is a boy and you know the development of machinery more and more spindles more and more threads being spun uh, the transformation of the mode of production in one sphere necessitates a similar transformation in other spheres so spinning was his leading example uh, spinning of cotton into yarn and after spinning then weaving had to be mechanized to keep up basically uh, and a lot of weavers were thrown out of work and the means of transport had to be mechanized to keep pace with the flow of cotton and so on and so forth, right? So is summing up here, machinery operates only by means of associated labor or labor in common. Hence the cooperative character of the labor process in this case now is a technical necessity dictated by the very nature of the instrument of labor. And when I say this, I mean, you know, Marx qualifies this. If you take the sentence on its own, you would think he's kind of like accepting and not critiquing this. He does critique it, but that's how the situation appears, right? It looks like this is how it's set up. You know, the machines are set up in this way, and there you are. That's how you've got to all work together because that's how we've laid it all out. So capital's domination and exploitation is now imposed mechanically. He looks quite a lot at the transfer. We've seen constant capital in earlier chapter eight. He looks at this in more detail. He looks at uh, how the value of the machine is transferred bit by bit uh, in the life of the machine. Um, he does lay an argument. Uh, I think he's quite open about certain questions actually, which he's quite prepared to explore and not be too doctrinaire about it. Some of these points are quite important for the declining rate of profit, which he looks at in volume three, uh, which is that if machines are being used more and more, then what 
how much is the cost of making the machinery? How much is how productive is the labour that makes the machinery reducing their cost? Right? That's a big issue, actually. Um, the other thing that he looks at uh, in passing, but which is also really important uh, for future reference, is he says in large scale industry, Manasik succeeded in making the product of his past labour, labour which has already been objectified, perform gratuitous service on a large scale, like a force of nature. And from the other side uh, of it, when he looks at agricultural production, uh, it's this thing about use values being generated by something uh, for free, if you like, uh, in that sense, right? And this is something that he does look at uh, from the other side, as I say. So this is the idea of a sort of a, a complex and multi, multi-layered production mechanism, all different types of machines. They'll all be passing their value over at slightly different rates to the actual production of the stuff. Now, this is a slightly technical point, but it actually, again, is quite significant for his later argument. Uh, and you'll probably have to study this to really capture it. So I'll, I'll say it, but um, I think we'll need to discuss it and you know probe into it more. Right? He basically says each individual co commodity, uh, the new value decreases. And that means that there's a lesser proportion of variable capital compared to the constant capital. Uh, as labor becomes more productive, then there's less labor power needed uh, passed uh, into the value of the new commodity. Okay, so as the commodity becomes uh, cheaper, so the proportion of variable capital decreases even more, okay, and the proportion of content capital increases, right? And that's uh, something that we'll discuss, I think, and look at quite carefully, uh, because it, uh, he gives an example here of that. And what you have to, what we should know is that he's talking about the industrial revolution, basically, and he's saying, you know, these, the gain in productivity was quite enormous. But when when this happens, it means that for any given hour of work, an awful lot more raw material is being turned in into yarn. So you can imagine, therefore, since raw material is also um, content capital, then the proportion of the value of the product of the commodity, even though its actual value goes down, the component of it, which comes from the transfer of existing value, becomes much higher compared to the addition of new value per item of the product. Marx is, uh, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't do a full analysis, but he does draw attention to the production of cotton in always in slightly sort of partial ways. And one of the partial ways he draws attention to it is the invention of the cotton gin to separate the seeds. I think you can just see them from the actual uh, fluffy stuff. And um, that was an example he uses of an increase in productivity due to the use of machinery without giving a fuller context. Why should capital adopt new technology? This again is an important point, which I, I think we, when we come to it, we'll need to reflect on and think about the consequences, okay? In any mode of production, machinery will replace, uh, uh, that is more productive, means that more use values are produced in any given expenditure of labor, which means that labor will be displaced by the adoption of machinery. Okay, now that's generally going to be the case. You're going to need fewer workers, relatively speaking, to make more stuff, or the same number of workers will make even more stuff. Okay, right. Now, in a capitalist mode of production, it's something more than that again, right? Because it's the capitalist will pay only the value of the labor power employed, right? This is a very important distinction that Marx is making. So, the limit to whether or not the uh, capitalist adopts a machine is not how much labor power it, uh, it um, displaces, but how much paid labor it displaces. And this actually is a very important interaction in terms of the dynamics of the capitalist mode of production, because that's, uh, maybe the example is gonna make it clearer than the sort of the general point. So he talks about the Yankees have invented a stone breaking machine. Okay, 
Uh, now, the English do not make use of it. Why? Because the agricultural worker in England, the wretch, doesn't get paid enough to make it worth their while to replace his labor with a machine. Okay, so it wouldn't actually reduce the cost of production. It actually increased the cost of production. So there's an interaction between how much the worker's getting paid and whether it's a rational choice or not for the capitalist to adopt machine production. And it's not a technical thing, it's purely social relations. So if the workers are being paid more, as they are in the US at the time than in England, then it could well be that the capitalists there will take on this new technology, whereas in England they won't. Uh, the sort of wage differential between the US and England at the time, you know, would be, they would be roughly comparable. I mean, maybe 30% different, something like that. But if you think about it um, in different countries today, then this is, you know, an enormously important factor. And that whether or not machines are taken up, it depends on the cost of the labor power or the price or the wages of, that workers get between the two. Okay hugely important point. This is um, a steam plow. That's the plow. That's what powers it. And it gives you an example here. This would replace 66 men. Uh, but if the men are paid low enough, <laughs> then they won't even take it on. Now, this is what I wanted to get to. And I know we're a bit tight on time, but this is actually, the, um, in a way, the punchline section that I wanted to get to. The effects of machine production on the worker. Okay. Uh, that Marx actually identifies three distinct effects. And you might remember right at the very beginning, I put those arrows in, right? Um, so what we have is let, he wants to look at the general effects of this machine production revolution, industrial revolution on the worker himself, right? Now, what he's doing is he is looking at this from the point of view of the workers, right? Um, but there's also, you could say, well, that's subjective and it's there with what they experience, but it is subjective and what they experience, but it is also a new objectivity because what we'll see is one of the effects on the working class as a whole is the reality of creating a surplus population, right, um, as well. And it's an objectivity which is about surplus value production. So the first effect that Marx identifies is the appropriation, he says, of supplementary labor power by capital. And he's identifying that being that labor power provided by women and children. So that's the first result. OK, so the way that machines can get more workers as wage laborers is by reorganizing what is acceptable in terms of who enters the labor process and all of a sudden uh, women and children who maybe for slightly different reasons were not seen as being in the labor process suddenly become demanded as a workforce. Um, so whatever role um, was played within the family in, in customary terms has been seized hold of and usurped by capital, especially in relation to children. Children's role is much more Marx's focus here than uh, women's role, it has to be said. He gives us a lot more information about that. Um, so what he's saying is this depreciates the value of labor power. That's the term he uses, because now the man's labor power has to cover uh, spread over the whole family. So they might get paid a bit more, but they won't be paid like if there's four workers, they won't be paid four times as much, right? They'll be paid one and a half times as much covering the family as a whole, right? And so the price of labor power falls and it falls in relation to the excess. Uh, uh, so it, it falls and that means that there's more excess uh, surplus labor. There's even more surplus labor and excess of surplus labor. Sorry, I slightly spoiled the point, but that's what he's saying. Okay, and this is a very, you know, I draw attention to this because what he's saying here is this will increase the degree of exploitation. Uh, and this, we've noted before that children were used here in two ways. Mostly they would have to duck under the machines to keep clear the workings underneath. And they were also used as sort of like a human conveyor belt. They were pushing the containers around from one work post to another in, in the cotton mills. And he gives examples now of um, what this means. It means that previously the worker sold his own labor power. And that was, if you like, the starting point. This, he says this is our first assumption, uh, that 
<coughs> formally at least the worker confronted the capitalist as a, a free man selling his own labor power but he says actually well that's not quite true is it in the sense that uh, he sells his wife and his child as well and even he uses the the parallel with the selling of enslaved uh, African Americans right um, what is also clear so there's a qualitative change in the social relation here whatever whether or not how far we go with the analogy but certainly this is a different social relation being imposed uh, by the demands of capital and just in terms of reward for this work uh, kids were being paid about four shillings a week sometimes a bit less actually uh, if they were teenagers i say kids this is this meant to be teenagers juveniles rather than children a uh, normal wage at that time that marx uses as an example is about nearly four times as much this is an illustration from the mill which is the tv program i sort of uh, encourage you to all see if you can get hold of it and you can see the main workforce inside the mill were teenage young women i mean girls stroke women basically they were the ones who were the core and then there were men folk around as well and children as well but this is the they were the core staple of the workforce the other big effect is the prolongation of the working day so he goes back to the limits of the working day material and he explains a certain logic to it which is basically if the capitalists invest a lot of money in the machine and they want to get the value of it uh transmitted before a new machine invention comes in to take its place then they're going to work the machine hard very early on and they want to avoid the sort of the downtime and they want to leverage as much as possible the value out of the machine so this is an idea of moral depreciation now this illustration is not actually quite right in the sense that i think that the, the jump down is even sharper than this this suggests i mean that's 15 percent a year i mean I think it's actually sharper than that and then and then it evens out even more so what the wear and so there's two things here the wear and tear of the machine is passed over but there's also this question of moral depreciation and the moral depreciation is the one which encourages uh the catalyst to extend the working day as much as possible to get as much uh, of the investment in the machine back again before it becomes uh, superseded by another technology. Uh, there's a section here where he rehearses a, almost uh, very closely conceptually the argument he gave us in uh, chapter 12 about the concept of relative surplus value. And I mean, he, I won't go into detail. I've made the arguments in the previous uh, lecture, but I, confirmed in my view of what his argument is the increased or in higher degree of labor of the innovating capital is transitional uh, and it is a sort of monopoly because uh, they're the only ones with this new machinery but as soon as the other capitalists adopt it then the monopoly in the uh, in the greater degree of production of value as well as of use values uh, passes on goes away and we go back to what we were before same value but now spread over more commodities being produced there you go that's what he's saying the social value of the machine's product sinks down to its individual value okay so we you go in uh more constant capital per item and the same amount of new value but spread over more items basically now he points this out and this is a big anticipation of what he will he will come back to in volume three which is that this is an imminent contradiction okay um because the rate of surplus value it depends on the number of workers and uh, the, the amount of surplus value depends on the number of workers and the rate of surplus value but you can increase the rate of surplus value but you can't increase it beyond a certain point because if you're diminishing the number of workers then the basis for surplus value is being undercut and mark sees this he points here as a what he calls a dialectical inversion which is uh, the most powerful instrument for reducing labor time becomes the most unfailing means for turning the whole light on the worker and his family into labor time at capital disposal 
Uh, I didn't find a graphic to show imminent contradiction. If there's a better one, I'll be happy to use it. That isn't really, that's a, that is a contradiction, but I'm not sure how imminent it is. It's just two things that can't be true at the same time. And the third uh, one that Marx identifies uh, is the intensification of labor. There are two ways in which labor, he notes, is intensified. One is that more machines are being looked after, greater quantity of machinery being supervised or operated. And the other is that the speed of the machines is increased. So the workers are working in a more intense way. They have fewer gaps in the labor process. They're continually at it. They can't rest at all you know, in the moments of uh, respite in what they're doing. And he sees this as, <coughs> uh, he discusses this in relation to rather than increasing surplus value by extending the working day for the same length of working day, just uh, workers working more intensely. And actually Marx anticipates uh, with his uh, discussion of the speed of machines, he anticipates something which actually occurred you know, a generation after his death, right? which is the introduction of the conveyor belt and the production line based on you know, a conveyor belt which management can speed up at will and you know, which the workers hate, basically. And Henry Ford, we can thank for the one who introduced this system. And we will also thank Charlie Chaplin, but we don't have time right now. Maybe afterwards you can look at how Charlie Chaplin has his uh, welcome satirical take on the production line. Okay, so this was all around about 1850. So the adoption of machinery in England, especially in the cotton mills, meant an awful lot more cotton was produced and a double, more than double, nearly three times the volume and nearly three times the value. Okay, so remember 1848 was when the 10 hour day was implemented, right? So capital actually fought the uh, legislation uh, tooth and nail, but when it came in, they changed the way they extracted surplus value. So rather than longer working days, they used the machinery to increase the intensity of the working day within those 10 hours. And in actual fact, <laughs> that was very successful. It turned out that that was better for capital in a sense, right? They managed to get massive increase of production from this change of method. 10 hour working day, very intense, more production. So summing up, um, chapter 15 so far, these are the points. The worker is reduced to a, an attendant in many ways. There's a diminishing proportion of new value to constant value transferred. 1848 was a big impetus uh, to machine production, uh, but with increased intensity. These things, uh, absolute and relative surplus value, aren't separate, but they're combined interactions of how surplus value can be increased for capital. Um, what he does also do, and this is really my commentary, he, he identifies an effect that is a method of increasing surplus value, i.e. by employing women and children, but without actually formulating that as such, as a method of increasing surplus value. So he doesn't incorporate it into his theory of surplus value. Um, and there's one thing I, I skipped, which is that obviously there's huge impacts of this machine production in terms of the continuation of hierarchies of labor. Uh, you know, the engineering workers who get to design and make the machines versus the people who are just stuck on the production, uh, you know, with them. And what you've got there for is a, capital is re redividing the structures between mental and manual labor it's destroying the some degree of unity of purpose between mental and manual labor which the workers had and it's taking it all to itself um, and this is my commentary on this which i had i had thought to leave to a bit later on but i want to make it now um, so what we've got now is different methods in which uh, capital can increase surplus value whether or not it's capitalist mode of production, all labor processes will have a duration and they will have tools and raw materials and the workers will have skills and they will work with a certain degree of intensity. All these things are not particular to capitalist production. I mean, but capitalism obviously shapes them in its own particular way, in its own specifically capitalistic way. 
Now, in the capitalistic way, all these sort of attributes become levers to increase surplus value. <coughs> the issue of the commentary I make is that these different levers are given a different theoretical status in capital. So Marx in volume one certainly does look at length and working day and what we've just been looking at, the, uh, the implementation, if you like, of relative surplus value. And he does combine this in chapter 17 with a discussion about how these three things combine with intensity. But he's also, his text does give us other ways in which uh, capitalists can increase surplus value. One is to increase the skill of labor power, which he you know, mentions in and out and then uh, says in principle, it's not hard to, to work out. This is a multiplier basically of simple average labor. He also does deal with extractive labor, actually, in my opinion, very well, but not until volume three, where the use values provided by natural variations become a factor in increasing surplus value. Um, and the one that I keep coming back to is the labor who is paid for their labor power at a lower rate, or their labor power, his, hers, labor power at a lower rate than the social norm. And this is a way of increasing surplus value. So what you have here is six, arguably seven, depending if you separate out these two, division of labor mechanization, methods of increasing surplus value. Um, but they all have to work within the overall concept of surplus value as well. Okay, just finally, finally, because I've definitely gone for a full hour. Uh, these are some suggestions for the reading group and some references to relevant uh, sources that I've mentioned on the way through. Okay, uh, that's the lecture finished for this time. <laughs>